fell in love with South America and decided that I wanted my first trip to be going to Peru. Um, so my first Peru experience was I decided that I was going to spend a month volunteering on an off-grid coffee, mango, and cacao farm. Um, so being very dirty and happy. <laughs> um, so I spent a month living with a Peruvian family, um, this awesome couple that was a Peruvian man and a Flemish woman, and they met while she was traveling in Peru, and they had wonderful children. Um, they lived in an awesome farm in the like eastern Peruvian mountains. Um, so they put myself and five other volunteers to work every day, um, kind of working in the fields and taking care of the animals. Um, every day someone would get up early to make breakfast and make lunch and dinner and we'd all work together for the afternoon and then come back and kind of relax with the family and the animals that were there. Um, and it really facilitated my travel for the most part. Um, I had never been outside of the US before. I had never <coughs> done any international travel. I had never volunteered anywhere before and knew that I wanted to take photos and I knew that I wanted to learn more outside of school and kind of living with this family who took me in was just like the best experience ever. Um, they taught me all about living off grid, about growing your own food, about harvesting things, about tropical climates, um, aqueduct systems, like they built an entire community themselves um, and really solely survived off of the help that volunteers gave them. Um, so, ways that you guys can find places like that is I use three different organizations um, to find these places. And the most helpful for me was uh, WOOF, or Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farming. And essentially, it's a huge compilation um, organized by continents. So there's one for Latin America, one for Europe, uh, one for Asia, and everywhere throughout the world. Um, and you essentially pay like $10 for a list of all of these host families that will take you in and teach you. And for the most part, it's free. Um, for the work that you do, usually it's like four to six hours a day, doing pretty cool stuff most of the time. So you're like living in the Peruvian jungle with families and stuff. They'll feed you and they'll give you a place to stay for free. Um, another way that you can find places to stay is working with a website called Workaway or HealthX, where it's not specifically farm related things, but it's you're teaching English in like impoverished areas or you're volunteering to rebuild trails somewhere or working on farms or working in libraries or schools, working really working with communities um, wherever you want to go, whether it be in Europe or South America or Iceland or Russia or anywhere. Um, so those three organizations and websites were super helpful. Um, so then I had initially started traveling with two of my best friends and a month into the trip, we all kind of decided that maybe traveling together wasn't for us. <laughs> it was kind of a hectic situation, kind of stressful. It was very different from being at home where you're comfortable all the time and you see each other every day and you go out for a beer and watch a movie together. But when you're living in the jungle together for a month, you realize that sometimes you don't get along with each other. So. Um, at the end of that month, we all decided that we were going to split up and do our own thing. Um, so I ended up being out of the country alone for the first time um, and really doing my first international solo travel very unexpectedly. Um, so I had started thinking about what I wanted to do and I started thinking about where I wanted to go now that I had all this freedom to go wherever I wanted to go without thinking about the rest of the group. Um, so I had started going south. Um, and I knew that a huge bucket list item for me was I wanted to go to Patagonia, even though it was on the other side of the continent that I was on. So I had started my journey south, which took about a week via public <coughs> transportation. Um, but I was also a sophomore in college and I didn't have any money and I knew that I wanted to stay for as long as I possibly could. So my trip turned into, instead of a one month trip, a four month trip. Um, backpacking the whole way down the eastern coast of South America all through Chile. Um, and also, speaking of public transportation and cheap travel, I the entire month that I was in Peru, including my flight round trip, I spent $600. Whoa. Um, 
really working on farms and volunteering my time and when you're working with the family they feed you. Um, my flight that I found was through Student Universe, which is also another great website. If anybody's a student and you want to travel, they give discounts to students who want to travel internationally. Um, so yeah, definitely check them out. And then, so I started going south um, via bus and not very comfortable buses either because shoestring budget. So I had really started taking local buses with usually no other travelers I saw. Um, and we drove everywhere through the high peaks in Peru, snow-capped mountains, all the way through the salt mountains in southern Peru, um, crossing into the Chilean desert, um, kind of seeing nothing for many miles, but still very beautiful. Um, so another way that you can travel also is public transportation buses. Um, I would take 30-hour bus rides for $20 sometimes. Um, but it was much more accessible than taking a plane for me. Um, it wasn't always the most comfortable, but I saw so much more of the country than I ever thought I could. I would spend 30 hours on a bus driving through like beautiful pink sand deserts and seeing the sand mountains and the salt mountains and seeing wildlife, seeing like wild ponies and seeing sheep everywhere. And you're looking down from sometimes 11, 12,000 feet into the valleys. Um, and it's beautiful. So I definitely experienced much more. Also, I did a lot of hitchhiking, <laughs> which I don't recommend, but it was totally an experience. Um, so I finally got to the very edge of Patagonia, and it was a total dream come true. I had no idea that it was ever going to happen when I started out on this trip. I knew that I wanted to go, and for years it had been my dream. I knew I wanted to be a photographer of Patagonia. Is the place to go if you're interested in photography. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So I finally got here and I was just super, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got there. All I knew was just like I had this one mission. I was like, I need to go and when I get there, I will figure it out. And so I got there and I had no idea what I wanted to do. It was like as soon as you get there, you're just absolutely overwhelmed by the fact that you're there. And I realized that I had not planned at all before I got there. Um, so one of the hostels that I was staying in, there was a super awesome hostel owner who was very young and she was super interested in photography and art and said, you know, if you want to take photos, you need to go on these day hikes right here. So I ended up hiking up to um, uh, this is essentially a valley called Cerro Frey um, in northern Patagonia. and. I was still looking for cheap places to stay. I was running low on money. I didn't want to stay in hostels the whole time. So it was really finding campsites where I wanted to stay, um, which I wouldn't have done if I didn't ask locals. So ask locals for campsites and places to stay. If it's And usually hostel owners are very understanding of that. They understand that you know if you're young or even if you just want to travel, you want to see more of the country, the best place to see it is asking people that live there. Um, so specifically for this place, actually, I. <laughs> was the, I was there during off season and I was the only person that wasn't part of the Argentine military that was there. Oh God. Um, which was strange but really nice actually. So <laughs> my campsite was right in the middle of the valley and then directly next to where the military was camping, <laughs> doing all of their um, like climbing training for new recruits and whatnot. So that was kind of weird. Um, but super cool, and they saw that I was alone, and they were very welcoming. Um, it was all men primarily, and they, <laughs> I felt very safe and very welcome. Then they invited me over for dinner. They saw that I was alone, and they invited me into the tent to come and cook for me and give me a glass of wine as Argentine custom. Um, so yeah, it was just a super like spontaneous experience. Um, also felt really bad sunburn. Oh. Um, so then asking locals again, I knew that I wanted to get down to true Patagonia. Um, so I hopped on some more buses and took local routes again. And finally got to the village of El Chalten, where the infamous Mount Fitzroy is. Um, mm. And I was like really running low on money, didn't really know where I was going to go, didn't know where I was going to stay, had no idea what hostels were there. Um, but this was the first look I got of the town still on the bus, just right outside of the bus window. Um, some sheep on the side of the road. 
Um, so the village of El Chaten is actually a super tiny um, climbing town uh, because of Mount Fitzroy, it's a world famous climbing destination. Um, and also I had gone in, I guess I was there in March. Um, so it was still kind of off season. It wasn't really high season for tourists. There wasn't really much going on. Most places were closed. Um, so again, I had started talking to locals, asking what there was to do around. I had known that El Chaltén was a beautiful place to go, but really had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I had asked people and I said, day hikes out of the town were incredible. Um, and I, one of my biggest goals was to see all of the glaciers. Um, so this was probably only like a two hour hike outside of the town. Um, and then further, I had had two weeks left on my trip um, and I knew that walking on a glacier was like what I wanted to do. If you're in Patagonia, you want to see the glaciers, you want to see the mountains, you want to see the snow. Um, so I had hopped on another bus, driven another three hours south to almost as far south as you can get without being in Ushuaia, like the legitimate end of the world in South America. Um, and gone on a glacial trekking tour. Um, there's a couple other people. Awesome bucket list item. Um, and probably the coolest moment from the trip in general was as soon as we had got there, uh, it was right after like a huge thunderstorm had rolled out. So there was these huge black clouds that were just kind of hovering over the glacier. And like fog was rolling off, but it was still really chilly. Um, and it was just total highlight of the entire thing. It was you get there and you know that you made the right choice. Like every mistake that you made up until then was just the coolest experience ever. Um, and it wouldn't have happened unless I really talked to people there. Like I left before I was in the US and I left thinking I was gonna go on this great adventure with my two best friends and stay in Peru and be in the jungle the whole time. And <coughs> it turned into really learning to meet people and learning to get the most out of your adventure and really make friends. And people want to help you. People want to talk to you. And people want to hear your story. And they want to tell their story. And really talking to people will make your trip the best it can be. Um, so these are just a couple of the ways that I did it also. So I stayed in hostels the whole time I traveled. Um, and I found that using this website called Hostel World was super helpful. So it um, is essentially like Expedia, but specifically for hostels, finding like the cheapest places to stay that have the best reviews, youth hostels, adult hostels, um, kind of wherever you're staying, which is also a super cool way to meet people if you're into making friends, because you're sharing a room with 10 other people usually. <laughs> um, so whooping is another I explained earlier the farming organization HelpX Workway and then Couchsurfing, um, which I didn't use specifically on this trip, but I've used for many other travels before. So essentially it's like Airbnb, except you're not paying for it and you're sleeping on somebody's couch. And it's a super cool way to meet people. Um, it's kind of like hitchhiking via couch where People are certified, so you know that they're a real person. It's a legitimate experience. They're not going to be some creep that's like, hey, come sleep on my couch and I'll feed you and stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not like a, it's not like a sketchy Craigslist experience, but it's um, it's like booking a hostel but for free, and you're making a friend at the same time. Some of my best friends I've actually met through Couchsurfing. Um, they're vetted through the site, and they have to register their phone number and email, and they make sure that you're a real person. And yeah, what's up? Can you rate people? The way Airbnb works? You can. Okay. Um, you can review them and rate them, and then after people stay with them, they can write a review whether or not it was good. Um, similar in the way that Airbnb works, where you can say, like, this happened and this wasn't so good, and they won't necessarily tell the person, but it'll alert somebody um, within, like, the Airbnb system. Okay. Um, so it's, like, a very real experience. Why don't they charge? I mean, it just seems like Airbnb people. They char I think they charge, I really can't remember how much it was. The couchsurfing site charges, I think, like 20 bucks a year or something for your membership. And then they don't charge you anything to stay with people. 
Um, I think it, most of the time it's like other travelers like you that want to meet people and hear their experiences and want to learn about other cool places to go. Um, some of my best friends I've met staying particularly in the U.S. Um, have been through couch surfing. One of my best friends in Colorado let me sleep on his couch for like two weeks. <laughs> so it was um, pretty it's, cool. It's supposed to be a cool, I've couch surfed in Europe before, it's supposed to be more of a cultural exchange. Yeah. So it's not, you shouldn't see it as like, oh, I'm getting a free place to live. It's like, I'm, yeah. somebody's giving me access to like their culture and their customs and like how they live. Yeah. And so if you see it like that, and you know, so you're open to like hosting other people from other countries, then, um, and I believe it's free. I don't yeah. think they've changed it yet. I don't think you have to pay a, a member. Yeah, I can't remember if or they... a yearly membership. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, super great because you can make a profile on it. Um, so it'll say like, what books you like, what movies you like, yeah. what languages you speak, where you've been, um, the coolest thing that's happened to you while traveling, the scariest thing that's happening. Like, so you're starting a conversation with someone to build like a, a cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. Like you want to build a friendship. It's not just like, they expect you to kind of hang out with them a little bit too and get to learn more about their culture. So you're building a relationship also. Um, so the interface works similar to Airbnb, but is more of like a personal connection of somebody. Um, yeah, and that's my story though. So you can follow me on Instagram if you want to see some cool adventures, but does anybody have any like questions or stories or? Did you know Spanish before you left? I did. Um, not very much. I had just taken Spanish in high school. And then by the time I left, I think being there for four months was like, I left and I felt super comfortable like conversationally. It really helped knowing even minimal Spanish. Because in most towns, most people speak English and most people um, can kind of grasp the idea of what you're saying. So it wasn't terribly hard to like get your point across, but it really mm -hmm. helps like when you're in the smaller like towns in Peru and um, not so much in Argentina, but specifically more Peru. Anybody else? What did you use for maps? I didn't. <laughs> I specifically did not use any maps. Um, I used a lot of Googling where places were and asking people which bus to take, um, which worked out pretty well. When I was in Patagonia specifically, I had one map that I got from like a tourist like stand in the middle of some big city that was like super unhelpful it was like museums here and bus stations here and for the most part it was asking people. Mm. Nope. No, I was, yeah, I know. Mappy hour and I use no maps for anything. But yeah. <laughs> 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 it's fine. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a question. Yeah. Um so you're a photographer? Yes. Did you did you come to find your your uh, camera as like, was it did was it ever a barrier between you and the cultures you were trying to immerse yourself with, or was yeah. it a tool that you could kind of um, engage with people, or what was your experience on that side of the lens? Um, I had a super hard time remembering to take photos. Mm. Actually, you took I some good ones. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had a super hard time remembering to take photos. Um, because the trip turned into a much longer trip than I had expected, it at the time became more important to me to experience things and it was super difficult. Like specifically when I was on the farm in Peru, I was really into like taking photos and making this story and building the relationship with the family and really getting to know the culture and at the time it really helped with that. Um, mm -hmm. I had communicated to them that I would wanted to do a story on it, I wanted to do a photo essay. And then after that, I found it more difficult to pick it up, specifically in like more like stereotypically beautiful places where there's like glaciers and big snowy mountains everywhere. I mm. found it much more difficult to connect with everything. But it's also, I think it's a good balance sometimes you need to kind of at least for myself, I need to step back and check myself and make sure that I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing and not mm -hmm. living through my camera. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's tough to do. Yeah, it's, I struggle with it now all the time still. It's, it's hard to separate yourself from what you're doing. Did you go to school for I did, yeah. Um, I went to FIT for photography and I was a photo major. Um, 
uh, even when I took my gap year between my sophomore and junior year and I knew that I wanted to do photography but I had no idea what kind. I was like, I like taking pictures of pretty things and pretty places. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. When you first started on this trip, like, what did you expect your career or you know, expect to like about photography then and how has it changed to where you are now? Um, I was, as many photographers are, super inspired by National Geographic photographers and I, as many other and still am, um, but I was like, I want to be a photojournalist and go to all these cool places and write all these stories and do like all this badass stuff. And it, at the time, I struggled with it a lot, really building those stories and building those relationships. And also, I had realized after that trip that I had a hard time balancing the emotional experiences and being a photojournalist would be difficult for me specifically because I have a hard time separating myself from that. Um, so afterwards, I had kind of decided that I wanted to go the more commercial route. Um, I still love traveling. I still love taking photos. I still love the art of photography, but not, and I admire photojournalists and I wish that, not necessarily wish that was my career, but I admire that aspect of it. But for me personally, I wanted to go the more commercial route, have a little bit of a more relaxed, less dangerous life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely. It was that trip specifically that had changed that for me. Like living it for long term was difficult. Did you see Akonkawa? I did not. Everyone told me that I should go, and I did not. Have you been? It's like, I want to go back so badly. Next time, next time. Yeah, I'm like dying to go back. There was so much stuff. Even within that four months, like, there was so much stuff that I just didn't see that. It's a big place. Yeah, it's a huge place <laughs> for sure. What's your next place? I don't know. I think Hawaii. I think in July I'm going to be going to Newfoundland for mm -hmm. a shoot. Um, it is undetermined at the moment, but I think it will be shooting backpacks for someone in Canada. Hopefully a backpacking um, iceberg trip. Mm -hmm. How long do trips like that take to last? Um, it varies from trip to trip. Um, for the most part, if I'm doing commercial work for someone, the general time has been 10-ish days. Um, but it, it really varies. Sometimes it's a weekend. If it's something small, sometimes it's 10 days, sometimes it's longer. Um, for me personally, a lot of the time I'll plan a trip um, and reach out to other companies and be like, hey, I'm planning like a month long trip to, I don't know, let's say like Columbia. Um, and I want to do like a backpacking trip up to some mountains in Columbia. Or I want to go to Ecuador and I want to go to Cotopaxi. Um, is there any assets that you need? And most of the time people will work with you on it. So if you're going on a trip, it would be you would have multiple clients or multiple people that you'd be shooting for at the same time, so it's not necessarily one thing you're working on. Um, so you're kind of packing a lot into a very small trip, um, which for me I find personally more rewarding, but it kind of varies from thing to thing. What's up? Are you uh, signed with somebody? Like an agency or agent? I'm not. I freelance. Yeah, I'm a little uh, skeptical of the agent thing right yeah. now, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. But yeah. What are some of my favorite songs you listen to? Your songs I listen to? That's a really good question. Um, I have like a pretty big playlist. I, a lot of it's like very. You always have like a song you like go back to when you like when you listen to any What would you say are some of the songs? For this trip specifically, a lot of Manu Chao stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, really love Manu Chao. <laughs> Like when I was on the farm, we there was about five other volunteers with me, and we would um, it was like mango harvesting season when we were there, so we were like clearing fields to plant avocado trees and then harvesting mango. And there was a Chilean couple that was with us that was like absolutely in love with Mono Chow, so we would get up at like six o'clock in the morning and blast like everything <laughs> for the whole day. So it was kind of on repeat for the whole day. So. Modern Chow is like anything Modern Chow is definitely the go-to for that trip. That's a good question though.
wanted to give advice to somebody who was your age when you started this trip, like, what would you tell them to how to prepare, what to be aware of, what to know is coming your way? I get that question a lot, and I never know how to answer it. Um, specifically because a lot of people, the reaction I get the most is a lot of people ask me, or a lot of people say, I wish I could do that. Um, and people assume that like, I have a lot of money, I can like travel a lot because I have a lot of money and I can do all these cool things because I have like people that'll pay for me to go places and a lot of it's, I went because I wanted to go and I found a way to make it go. And it's cheesy to say, but it's like, if you want something, like go for it. If you want something, make it happen. Well, more specifically, is there a skill set that you should have before you set off on adventure like that where there's so much that's unknown or is there a certain type of temperament you should have or be clear about before you take on something like that? I don't think so. I think it's more of just like be open to things changing because nothing is ever going to go the way you plan it. Yeah, nothing. Like almost nothing on that trip went the way that I planned and if you can like roll with the punches, that's pretty much it. I mean, I wouldn't say it necessarily it's a certain temperament. Um, I think it's just learning to relax and let things happen. Mm -hmm. So, I guess like building upon that, so our cup challenge is different, which is a brand of companies. If you don't have, let's say, like a robust portfolio, I guess how would you go about uh, attracting these companies to hire you? A lot of the time, when I first started doing it, I and I, I still, for a lot of things, I do a lot of things for free. Like, you want your stuff to be seen. If you don't have a robust portfolio, shoot stuff with your friends. Like, find a clothing brand you really like, or a brand that you have that you really like their stuff and you have a lot of it, and go out with your friends and take photos of your friends and the stuff, and take photos of, like, if you're a climber or a hiker or a runner, Go out and take photos on your hikes and climbs and runs, and you can build your portfolio doing stuff with friends. Um, and then once you have, like, you don't need a ton of work for it. Like, you have maybe 10 trips that you've done, even just small local hikes. Um, be like, hey, I would love to photograph some of your things. So the way I started out was I had emailed companies that I really liked, um, generally smaller ones. Like, I think I started off going to Whole Foods, and I looked through like the granola bar aisle and looked for like the granola bars that nobody ever heard of <laughs> and like took a picture of the back of the granola bar and was like hmm I'm sure that they would love photos of something um, look at their Instagram and send them an email and say hey I'm a photographer um, I'm gonna go on this trip I would love to collaborate with you and most of the time you won't get paid when you're just starting out but They'll be like, sure, we'll send you like 13 cases of our granola bars. <laughs> like, take them on every trip you're ever going to go on. Um, and then you send them your photos and they'll post them on social media. And the more you do that, the more people will see your work. Um, go to events like this and talk to people. And it's a lot of networking and a lot of spending time doing photography and taking photos of things you like. And if people see that you like what you're photographing, they catch on to that. And if they see that you're doing it consistently and you're really like putting yourself out there, um, you'll catch on.